There's something about creating art and definitely around music and around music therapy, there's a real art to that and a real art to engagement and business is the same. It feels like making art. Writing a book, certainly, again, that creative spirit and essence of art continues to come around and, and, and play. There's play in all of it. You know, we don't talk about play in business a lot. If it wasn't fun, I don't think I'd still be doing it. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 151 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I have an interview with Jennifer Buchanan. Jennifer is the president and founder of JB Music Therapy. She's a highly regarded expert and trailblazer in her field. She started her business in 1991, now almost 30 years later. She is an invited presenter and keynote speaker at national conferences spanning many areas, including healthcare, education, leadership, and small business development. She's the author of Wellness Incorporated and Tune In and has her executive MBA. And we have an inspiring conversation about music and art and connectivity and connections and all those magic things that can happen. But that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's get to some comments from recent episodes. From episode 147, Getting Motivated with Master Encourager Michael Arterberry, Amy Tassicata said, Really needed this boost of motivation. Thanks. I'm glad to hear that, Amy. Actually, really, really glad to hear it, because not only did you get that boost of motivation from listening to episode 147, but congratulations, Amy! You're also the randomly selected winner of a copy of Michael's book, Be Encouraged, 250 Days of Motivation and Encouragement, just for commenting on that episode. Yes, randomly selected from all one commenters. See, it's that easy. Congratulations, Amy. I'm going to be reaching out to you to find out how I can uh, get this book to you. I'll order it through local bookstore, drop ship it, uh, etc. Um, and um, congratulations. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you for leaving a comment. And I um, hope that the motivation in Michael's book is also rewarding and satisfactory for you. You can also reach out to me, Amy, Mark at marklesley.ca and we can get that established. So congrats again and thanks for the comment. Comment on episode 149, Killing It on Kickstarter with Russell Nolte. Katie Mack says, to mix my metaphors, oh, and Katie, I love mixed metaphors, so thank you. Um, to mix my metaphors, this was a barn-burning eye-opener of an interview. I love Russell Nolte's description of the democratization of the creative process that Kickstarter allows. In the Renaissance, or the Renaissance. How do you pronounce that? Maybe you guys can correct me. But in the Renaissance, let's say, creatives were at the mercy of patrons like the Medicis. I hope I got that one right too. Wow, I'm just not doing well today. Uh, to allow them to scrape out a living. And so they had to make art that glorified the Medicis. We still require patrons, but with Kickstarter, it's possible to find them amongst ourselves, which means we can make art that explores our own lived experiences. It's never easy, but at least it's now possible. Thanks for this, Mark. Well, thank you, Katie. I, Katie, I know it's Kathy, Katie, but I love, I just have to say this. So Katie Mack, the way that she spells her handle is K-8-T-Y, uh, capital M-A-C. Uh, so I, I love that. I just think that's so cool. Um, but I really appreciate you looking back on the the Renaissance and 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 the patrons, and, and, and how this this is a new thing tech, technology-wise, obviously with Kickstarter, but it's not a new thing. It's a classic thing. So thanks for that reminder. I really appreciate that. And thank you uh, for that comment as well. Now, ironically, when I give a prize away, I always randomly 
select uh, a prize for uh, the same prize for one of my patrons. And ironically, Katie, you're actually the patron winner of Michael's book as well. Because what I do is I put all patrons into a random draw. Usually the draw is based on comments for an episode by a particular date. But then I put all patrons who don't have to enter that way into a random number draw where if you're a $1 a month patron, you get one chance to win. If you're $3 a month, you get two chances. And $5 a month, you get three chances to win. And Katie, your name came up in the random selection. So congratulations. I'll uh, be messaging you to figure out the best way to get that book to you, whether it's dropship or um, from a local bookstore that I can special order and you can pick it up or, or whatever. Curbside pickup, whatever happens to be the safest way of getting it nowadays. So that's the prize for Michael Arterbury's book from episode 147. And yeah, I'm glad uh, that it was motivational uh, for, for you guys. Also, episode 149, where uh, Russell inspired and motivated a lot of people to, to to see the light when it came to Kickstarter as yet an alternative, additional way uh, for creating and generating revenue and staying engaged with your audience uh, in a positive way. So that's it for the comments for recent episodes. If you want to leave a comment, you can leave a comment for any episode over at starkreflections.ca. You can also at me on Twitter. I'm at Mark Leslie. That's enough for that section. Let's move on to this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices, which allows you access to professional narrators from around the world, or if you already have your audiobook, the ability to upload your book yourself, control your price, and distribute it to 43 plus retail and library systems around the world. Now this week, I received the first of a new series of automated emails from Findaway Voices with a new feature that includes the latest retail and library links that were found to my newest audiobooks to save me having to do that hunting on my own, which is great. It's a handy and convenient way for me to know when the newly published titles have appeared on the various of their 43 plus retail library websites that Findaway Voices distributes to. Now, I received emails this week with nine new links for A Canadian Werewolf in New York, six new links for Night Cries, eight new links for Ode to Classics. Now, Night Cries and Ode to Classics are my short uh, fiction collections in the Nocturnal Streams series. Those are books one and two in that order. And nine new links for Stowaway, the book 1.5 in my Canadian Werewolf series. So, Wow, when I actually look back at that, I think, I, I guess I've been really busy publishing audiobooks in the last month or two uh, via Findaway Voices. So that's kind of exciting to see that I've actually made uh, that progress. Now, what I did with those links is I immediately opened up my Universal Book Links dashboard. Now, Universal Book Links is something from uh, draft to digital It's a free tool any author can use, no matter how you publish, traditionally published, uh, indie published, um, and even if you don't use Draft Digital to publish, you can use it for free. And I have Universal Book Links for every single one of my books there. And now that you can add audiobooks there, what I did is I took, opened up the email, opened up another tab, and I copied uh, for any of the retailers I didn't already have. I copied those links into my Universal Book Links. So if you go to bookstreet.com slash stowaway, for example, or bookstreet.com slash a Canadian werewolf in New York, if you want to type that many letters, you'll see all of the retailers and all of the um, audiobook markets where uh, you can find those books, which is kind of cool. Thanks to yet another convenient tool from Findaway Voices. And if you want to learn how you can leverage the really cool tools and features available to indie authors and small publishers from Findaway Voices, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now time for a personal update. Now, I recorded a special reflections on other podcast episodes for patrons. And I did a reflection on episode 190, the last episode, for now, apparently, of The Writer's Well with the always awesome Rachel Heron and always awesome Jay Thorne. Now, both of these awesome people, I do love the both of them, have been guests on past episodes of this podcast. And what I did is I looked at the conversation that Jay and Rachel had, and it was a very emotionally infused conversation because you can tell that they are just the dearest of friends and and I love the chemistry the two of them have but very emotional 
discussion that they have on the reasons for deciding to shut down this wonderful podcast that they love and is doing really, really well. But it, even though it's something they love, they had to shut it down. And and so I I thought about the reasons, shared some some of my thoughts on that, and what it made me reflect upon. And that's uh, in that feed. Also for patrons, in the last week, I produced another special uh, episode with an audio walkthrough of the extensive details of the book launch that I spoke about in episode 150, as well as a 27-page PowerPoint with plenty of charts, graphics, and visuals to accompany or support the audio. So as I was walking through and explaining, like, this is why Bargain Booksy was the best bang for my buck, or Free Booksy, I should say, was the best bang for my buck in terms of the volume I got for the money. Uh, you can actually see the chart and how I did in, in all the different uh, areas through each of the days. And I want to say thank you to all of my amazing patrons for your support. I hope you found that extra content and the reflections helpful. I actually have two more reflections on other podcasts in the queue that I'm trying desperately to uh, you know, squeeze into my schedule to get to. And those will be coming out in the feed, hopefully in the next a month or so. And if you want to check out how you can support this podcast over on Patreon for a dollar, three dollars, or $5 a month and get access to additional content and the occasional surprise prize for just being a patron, you can check that out over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. But in more personal news, now the promos that I've done on this time around, which I talked about in detail in, in episode 150, last episode, they're actually starting to pay off as the read-through on that first free book in that series happens. Now, actually, I have to take a quick aside here because in the midst of this time around, still trending really well on the Amazon free list because that's one of the places you can see it really, really well. Amazon went and made it. And apparently, according to other authors I was speaking to, hundreds of other uh, people had this happen to, to them too, that the perma-free price match book stopped being matched and went back to 99 cents. So... I had been riding high on the ranking with that title. It was still within the top 500 of free books on Kindle and well in the in the low uh, realm of the top 100 of each of the three categories. I mean it was still in the in the top 10 for the longest time. And it went from the top 500 to something like 1.5 million in the paid store because it had been ages uh, since it had sales um, in the US market obviously. And uh, and it stayed there for three or four days, completely ruining the, the, the run I was on. And and it kind of, um, then they reset it back to perma-free. It's almost like they were cleaning house and shaking things up a little bit because a lot of authors were reporting the same thing around the same time. I know Sean Costello uh, pinged me right away and said, hey, because Squall had been in the top 100 for a year and a half, and then all of a sudden it was bam, it was like 1 million and something, uh, which is really, really frustrating because that's uh, a huge draw of getting people into his ecosystem but I lost (laughs) so much pretty much on Amazon I pretty much lost all of that paid traction that I had spent so much time and effort working towards which is a reminder see this is an early reflection that you can't trust Amazon not that they hate you they're just doing things that they're going to do and that's what they're going to do and that's fine they have every right to do it because there's no promise there you're actually gaming their system when you do perma free but You can't really rely on a single retailer. And that's why I hate it. If I were putting all of my eggs in one basket and then that basket breaks, you're toast to mix metaphors. As Katie mentioned earlier, I do love mixing my metaphors. And and that's one of the frustrations. So if if you're banging everything in and, and putting all of your support behind one thing, and that's the thing that frightens me the most, about being reliant on uh, a single retailer. Now, there's no mistaking it. And if you look at the details for episode 150, you'll see that the majority of my volume uh, and sales are, are coming from Amazon on, on this series, but not all of them. And what I'm hoping is to spread it out. And obviously, Amazon's going to be strong, but what I want to do is continue to build up my sales on the other platforms. But that that's a bit of an aside. So as I, as I started to say before I got sidetracked on my little soapbox, is I'm starting to see on Amazon, Apple, and Nook, eh, not so much on Kobo yet, uh, and uh, an SFA on Google Play so far. 
uh, with I think 260 uh, free downloads and, and no sales on that series uh, yet since the promo started. But I'm starting to see on those other platforms, I'm starting to actually see the accumulation of more frequent sales on a Canadian werewolf in New York and Stowaway. I attribute that to the, the series rebranding and also to the push that I've done on this time around. I'm now also starting to see some positive reviews coming in of those titles. It's a slow and a steady climb, but I'm in this for the long run. Also, in terms of writing, I actually got to uh, 7,600 words in Lover's Moon, which is the romance story of how Michael Andrews, my Canadian werewolf, first met Gail and how they fell in love. And I've been using the romance beat sheet that came with the awesome book Romancing the Beat by Gwen Hayes. And I'm having a blast writing some of the scenes from Gail's point of view. And I've just, it's been the first thing I've done every morning for the last week. I've gotten up and I've just worked on it for the first hour before I've done any of the other stuff. And that's been a really, really great thing that I look forward to every morning. And I'm really satisfied with it. The one weird thing is I suspect that uh, I was calling it a story. I believe it's going to end up being a novella because at this point I haven't even introduced Michael and Gail, so I haven't had the had all of the things that have to happen in that relationship to resolve that complete story, and I'm suspecting it's probably going to be kind of like Stowaway was supposed to be a story and it ended up being a novella. I'm suspecting I'm probably going to hit the 25k roughly is where is where uh, Lover's Moon is coming, but it's been a really really great experience. Again, inspired by seeing the sales the reviews, and the relaunch of this series. So that's been a really great experience for me after long last of not being able to write fiction. So that's great because, again, I have uh, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles due February 23rd, and that that's only 60,000 words, and I need to write in at least another 20, 30,000 words for that and then get it to my editor. So lots of uh, strange times. Now, I've also been pushing my Kickstarter for Obsessions, uh, the anthology. It's at 153% funded as I'm recording this with about 20 days to go. I'm halfway to the stretch goal of $4,000 US where I'll be able to pay contributors six cents a word. And also at the stretch goal, everyone who supports it will get my entire Nocturnal Screams eight book series of horror stories in ebook. And something I should mention because this is of great value to you, dear Reflective, is that Christine Catherine Rush and Dean Wesley Smith are offering a course for backers, and it's set at $201 Canadian for a three-week online writing workshop on crafting a horror short story. And if you've ever taken any of Chris and Dean's great WMG publishing workshops, you know the intensity, the quality, and the power of such workshops. This one is not only a steal, but it's also an exclusive. This is the first time that they've ever offered the course, so you'll be the first to experience it. But at that level, uh, you also get a copy of Campus Chills, an anthology I released in 2009, which was the world's first, the first propane anthology to be launched on an espresso book machine, and which was created specifically for that purpose, but also the first book launch where all three contributors appeared in five different bookstore locations in three different provinces within a 24-hour period as part of the launch celebration. Now, there's a link in the show notes at starkreflections.ca to the Kickstarter. Just be aware that the clock is ticking and time is running out. By the time this episode hits the RSS feed, there will be less than 20 days to take advantage of that. Well, that's it for the introductory matter for this episode. Let's get right on to this fascinating interview with Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer, thank you so much for hanging out with me here today. Oh, thanks for having me, Mark. So I am so excited to get into what you do and the way that you help people. But first, I think I want to go back to music in your life and, and why and how music became important to you. Yeah, I I was one of the the lucky kids who had a lot of music during public school starting very very young. Like we had band starting in grade 5 and that's when I would pick up my first clarinet. I was learning guitar by the time I was in grade 8. So I had wow. a lot of opportunity um to sing and and to engage with that. And it's what really motivated me to go to school every morning and um, really? motivated me throughout the day for sure 
And now, so you, I'm a big proponent. Oh, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. No, go. Well, I'm curious because you talked about the clarinet and then by grade eight, you were learning the, 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 the guitar. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite? Uh, there must, there, I imagine there may be <laughs> others in your life. Or I, I, I've seen video of you playing the guitar, so I know that you're still doing that. Yeah. You know, at the core, I think I'm a singer. I, I think singing has been something um, I gravitate to regardless of what else I use. But it's nice now being a music therapist, which I can tell you more about how I got there. But now being a music therapist, having a variety of instruments in your life became quite handy. So it's good. So the voice obviously is a beautiful instrument, right? Because it can do all these things. So much. What is it about voice? Um, is it the meaning of the of the lyrics? Yeah. Uh, is it the sound that can hmm. come out? What is it about uh, singing oh, that you love? That's such a good question. Um, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with quality for me. Um, there are, because, I mean, maybe you've had this experience too, where someone can say, sing the same song right but your emotional response to it can be so different just based on the tone and the quality i would say that's me that it comes down to that tone and i uh i I think that's also what led me again into um the work that i do and what i pay attention to in others is is working hard to create the actual quality of music that people will respond to the most emotionally to help them get through a difficult time. And that's, see, um, I'm, because I'm, I'm really excited to talk about music therapy, but we're, we're hitting on that emotional resonance that music mm-hmm. has with people. Mm-hmm. Where does that come from? How do, where, yeah. what, what is that? Right, right. And, and we've definitely been feeling it through COVID right now, yeah. where people have just naturally gravitated to using music to soothe them and to comfort them. Um, you know, there are biological reasons why this happens, where music has this incredible capacity to um, hit our reward centers of the brain and and to release hormones in our body that will help us feel better. And, and we definitely can get the feels from, from what music can do. Um, but it does seem like there's more doesn't it? I mean, biology is really important, but there seems to be this this deeper connection into um, what some of us might call the the foundation of our lives, the roots of our lives, and um, and and so for me, it's about the connection that can be made between human to human, person to person. Um, that's another reason why this COVID thing's been a little difficult because now we're communicating virtually so much more, including our musical sharing and, uh, and it's worked and we're making it work, but there is something about being there in the music together with somebody else. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love what you said about that, because uh, as a writer, I always think about the fundamental reason why people write is mm. storytelling, is mm. it's really to connect to people. And that is what music does. Mm. Right? And, and, and music beautifully can connect multiple people, because usually reading is a one on one sort of personal experience, but music can be communal. It can be one on one and definitely mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. But I think there was something else that you said or wrote once mm-hmm. that really, uh, mm-hmm. really made me reflect. And, and, and it was that everyone has a different relationship with mm-hmm. the same, it, same piece of music, not two different singers, but the exact same piece of music. Mm-hmm. They can get something different out of that. There's some power and magic mm-hmm. in that, isn't there? There is. And, and, and so you can sometimes hear that someone may have such a strong connection to a piece of music and you go, don't you just love it? Don't you just love that song? But they might not have that same relationship to it. Um, So it can also feel a bit let down because you want to be able to share it in the same way you're experiencing it and why. But that's where I think we have to understand that there's some music out there that is specific for you. That's your gift. That's what you are going to be able to have in your life. And, and you may not be able to share it in quite the same way with others. Excellent. So yeah. let's get to your superhero origin story of, of <laughs> where JB Music Therapy business came from. 
Oh, well, I, I, you know, I never get sick of ti or tired of telling this story because um, my granddad was the most miserable man um, you could meet. He was um, very classic. He didn't love us kids hanging around too much. He always sent us to the basement. And uh, he unfortunately um, had a second major stroke that sent him into what we would classify now as long-term care. At the time it was called extended care. And it was right off of the hospital. It looked like the hospital. There was nursing care, but there wasn't a lot of other quality of life um, experiences that you could have. And, and uh, he, so, so needless to say, the environment didn't make him any happier than what he was previous. And he struggled. He was not able to walk. He was no longer able to talk. He was quite a very strong man prior and, and now he was completely dependent on others, particularly my granny. And granny um, was one of the most special people in my life um, as a mentor, as as a woman leader. And uh, she was an incredible caregiver. She would show up at seven o'clock in the morning to be with granddad and and she would leave late at night. She would always bring home cooked meals. She'd bring in his favorite quilt. And so it shouldn't have surprised any of us when she said, uh, Jen, would you bring um, would you learn your grandfather's favorite song and come in and play it for him? And uh, I thought it was an odd request. Although I was doing music, we had never done that before. It's not, we weren't the family that sat around and sang together. This was brand new for us. And uh, the following Friday, I went in, I took my guitar, I had a, Granny put a chair right in front of Granddad. Um, I, I don't think he looked too pleased. I think I felt really uncomfortable. Granny didn't care. She put her hand on my shoulder and she says, go ahead, dear. And I started to sing the song and, um, we felt a shift almost immediately. Uh, the screaming lady that we always heard down the hall, her screams started turn, turning into song as she came into the room and sat beside me. And then we have the uh, wandering guy who would wander around. Granny had to pull up another chair. We were crowded in this room. And Granddad started to cry. And something shifted. And so did my Friday nights. And uh, until I would go into a music, the music therapy program uh, at Capilano University in North Vancouver, my Friday nights would be right there in the extended care hospital with some of my favorite people who taught me so much. Oh my God, that's beautiful. I, uh, I love how that started to bring people together from, and they're, they're, they're all doing different things or in mm. maybe stuck in patterns, whatever it was, mm -hmm. but the music kind of broke them out of mm -hmm. that and into mm -hmm. something really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So that's, uh, before mm -hmm. I get on to asking sort of the, nice. the next step, I, I, I am curious, what was the song? What, what was uh, White Cliffs of Dover was the song by Virlin, although we've done a lot of others. Another one of my um, grandfather's favorite, When Irish Eyes Were, Are Smiling, was one of his absolute favorites as well. And uh, so there were several that we learned he connected to. And that's essentially what I have learned from, from a lot of people. Lots of people not only are connecting to the quality of sound that we were talking about or a certain melody, like you said, some people really connect to the lyrics. Um, in this case, it seemed to be just that the, the essence of the whole thing um you know the coming together of different people going through really difficult challenges you know um i i look back now and after meeting so many people who have got had strokes and and just an, an at such a fast life transition um to have anything that uh reminds you that that you are still complete and whole and important and loved. Um, I feel that's ultimately what a music moment like that can do. 
Wonderful. Wonderful. So you had that experience that uh, you, you saw the power of that you obviously kept, kept, you know, the feeding that well and, and drinking from that well, because I think it's a, it's a two way street, right? <laughs> totally. Everybody gets something great. So true. Then how did that transition into your entrepreneurial <laughs> yeah, life? Right. Um, I, I feel so when I was a kid, Mark, I was that kid who just loved doing special projects. You know, the teacher would say, okay, we're doing, you know, a big project, group project. And those are my favorite things. And um, I, I believe what happened is when I graduated from the music therapy program, there were no jobs. So if I was ultimately going to pursue this profession, profession. I was the 133rd music therapist in Canada. So it was really early on. Wow. So if I was going to pursue this profession, um, I was going to have to go out and look, be entrepreneurial about it and start a private practice, just like other physiotherapists or massage therapists of private practice. That's what I ultimately was going to have to do. And, um, and as I did that, I realized how much I loved it, but I also don't love to work alone. I love to work with people. So that's where the hiring um, started and creating jobs for other music therapists started. Um, we are a team of uh, 20. Um, we serve many, many organizations. Now we're doing a lot of virtual work with those organizations and working that out. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been, I thought I was probably going to be in it for five years. And here we are 29 years as of two weeks from now, 29, 29 years. years, crazy. Wow. Well, three yeah. decades. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. <laughs> no, yeah. It's I was great. gonna say you're, but you're 29, aren't you? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious. So what kinds of um, what kinds of therapies are popular with your different clients? I imagine it's it's pretty diverse. Yeah, absolutely. So so our youngest client is two months old, and our eldest is around 104. Uh, we Whoa. not only work in long-term care, although that continues to be very, very close to my heart. And you can imagine right now, it's incredibly important we figure out how to make this work. Um, but we also work uh, a lot with kids, uh, with development. We work with um, kids that might be struggling with feeling connected to their world. Um, perhaps they have a diagnosis of something that um, they're wanting to uh, to identify, to strengthen, to um, to to feel good about so they can continue doing their life the way they want to do their life. Um, we work with youth. We work with those who are incarcerated. We work in end of life care and palliative care. Um, so uh, of course, a lot of in the realm of mental health right now. So there is, um, I would say that we're specialists when it comes to music therapy, but we're generalists when it comes to the populations we're serving. Oh, wow. I love that. So you, I mean, again, it's very adaptive into mm, the needs of huge. each client. Yeah. Wow. Uh, two months old. I get, yeah, I guess because uh, I, I'd heard somebody say when they were talking about the, the value of oral storytelling is that the very first sounds we've ever heard were, were our mother's voice very consistently exactly. for a long, long time. And so I think that auditory thing is probably one of our first developed senses, wouldn't it be? Absolutely. And, and here we, and it's also the last one to go which is also very interesting. Really? So our auditory um, environment, therefore, is something for us to really consider from while we're in utero all the way to end of life. Wow. Now, you said something earlier that really <laughs> struck a chord with me. And I was thinking about that communal nature of music bringing people together. And I was thinking about one of the things I love to do when I travel is 
go to a bar and listen to some local musician I have never heard before. Lovely. And they can be doing a cover song, you know, Billy Joel's The Piano Man, you know, it's a classic <laughs> that everyone knows, or their own unique music. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Often, often the commonality of a song we all know is uh, is quicker. Right, but right. Something beautiful that seems to happen. I, I, I end up, I have so many CDs because I'm so <laughs> enthralled with the experience of that community where there's oh. that performer and everyone there is just all connected in different ways. Because oh, Mark, do you have a particular story from somewhere you've been that was particularly fantastic? I, I wish I did, but I'd be we'd be going for hours. I think I'm one of the last times I remember experiencing that was in Portland, and I was there uh, for a haunted. Uh, uh, my my girlfriend Liz and I were there for a haunted. Yeah. Um, it was a haunted place, so we thought, okay. oh, we're going to stay overnight in this haunted place because we're writing a book about haunted <laughs> bars and breweries, and they brew their own beer, but they've got 13 rooms upstairs, and so there's a salon, a salon downstairs. <laughs> And, and it was like, oh, and, and even better, there's two local musicians because we both love indie oh, music. And great. so we went there and uh, El Robitaille was one of the musicians and I'm mm. getting the name of the other one. And they both weren't even from Portland. They were from mm. traveling. Elsewhere, yeah. And, 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 and it was great because, you know, the first musicians on were like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then the next one came on and go, oh my God, this is awesome. And the night just <laughs> became better and better Aww. and better even though we didn't see a Love that we, yeah, we, we we felt the spirit uh in a in a magical mm -hmm. way um yeah. and i still uh listen to their music and i've got their cds and i and i buy the rest of their music on mm -hmm. uh, you know google play and stuff so we can yeah. listen to it at home but i guess uh, the reason i was saying that is you'd mentioned you know covid and and, and therapy in person compared mm -hmm. to uh being distant because it's a it's a real community-based mm -hmm. thing how how do we how do we get that now that we, do we have do to it? maintain our distance and there's a global yeah. pandemic yeah it's it's been interesting for sure you know and yet um so i have a friend who puts on something annually called farm stock every year so she has a farm out in ontario and they put on farm stock and people travel for miles in order to go and and really um enjoy live making and uh, live music making and and the fire and the whole camping experience together and this year of course that wasn't able to happen for people and so she put it virtual and you know everyone was feeling ah, is this gonna work you know um but you went from home to home and people performed live from their home and showed their environments and created this connection in a new way was it the same no it was different but did you get some of the same feels yeah, I did. I definitely had a few tears coming down my face. I didn't realize how much I needed that connection myself. So, so you know, we we don't do it the same. We do it different, but for the same reasons. And I think we can continue doing that. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, uh, Liz and I went to see July Talk. They're uh, 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 an indie Canadian band, and uh, and it was at a drive-in. And it was a really unique experience yeah. where you couldn't cheer because we were facing the screen at the very back, but everyone right. would honk their horns really, really loudly. Oh, that's really cool, actually. Yeah, because I they like were on that. stage, but you yeah. were watching them on the big screen. Um, but it was, and, and again, I thought it felt not as fun as, as, a, as a concert, but a completely different experience because it brought us right. back to our childhood, too. Right. And remembering what it was like is, like, oh, yeah, we should have brought lawn chairs because the cars are parked <laughs> far enough right. away that we could sit in front of the car if we wanted. Right. Because <laughs> everyone else's stereo is so oh loud. Oh, my God. We could hear it. So, <laughs> so great. Um, so, so that, that, how, and then therapy, one on one therapy. Now, obviously, for, for, um, for seniors, because they're uh, high at risk, you have to be very, very careful about not bringing, uh, introducing uh, infection. How do you, work mm -hmm. with the seniors now is it virtual to have the home set up the ability yeah. for you to, to be there in, in in a like on a screen mm -hmm. it's been a real mix um the the sad part of this story is there's many places we're not back at yet right. um so virtual or otherwise and the reason we're not back virtually um, is primarily because you do need to have the human resource on the other side right. and people are busy 
like actually just finding the time in order to to make a program like this happen um is is why we have not been able to continue so that's been very difficult for everybody um and then yes there's this hybrid of virtual with maybe even a mix of live like since we're in the summer we are able to go and sit outside and do some programming outside right. um as well as doing some virtual work either one-to-one -one or small groups with a large screen in front of everybody um but you can imagine that you know when we're working with people that maybe can't see so well or maybe can't hear as well as they once did um, this can be particularly challenging so again it's specific people that are able to adapt to this environment and not in the same way as when we can actually be there um, with them we're still trying to work it out we are back in some places we've got full ppe on we are only going to one place a day so that would be yeah. um, part of what we're doing there um but it we're gonna have to continue working this part out yeah and i imagine it, it, it things continue to change and evolve as, as you move forward mm -hmm. so there are probably ways that people can um use music to re relieve stress and, uh, and other experiences. I, I think I read on your blog, uh, the importance of playlists and how mm. they may be an upfront investment, but they're actually <laughs> a benefit. And I know, I know writers have playlists that they write. Mm -hmm. playlists. So I'm wondering if you have any advice on, on playlists and how people can use that either for meditation or, or absolutely other, like, therapy. So it, it there are some of my favorite things to do with the general public um, working on team building. I love working with teams on this, actually, because it's a great way to connect and have fun um, amongst a group of people. Um, we often hear about people be belonging to book clubs, but we don't hear a lot about as often music clubs. And I really do think that could be a thing and we could make it a thing. So playlists uh one of the things i go through is about five different ways that you can put together a purposeful playlist um of course there's always the other ways where you could go on a new streaming service and you can download genres or feelings that you're looking for but this is different this is about um going to your specific music, uh, the the personal soundtrack of your life that you have had. So one of the first playlists I do suggest we all start with, and it will take time. It will um, be something that we can do over time. And that is just identifying your complete personal soundtrack. You might start from before you went to school, what sort of music and sounds were in your life? What was your, perhaps your home environment introducing you to? Um, perhaps you had a jewelry box that had a particular tune that you will never forget. I know I used to have those golden books that you would turn the page and you could hear the chime as they turned the page because there was a cassette that went along with it, you know? So those are so, and it could also be television. I mean, you can think back to um, Fred Rogers and you can hear all of the sounds and um, oh what was the one um, with the flute um, friendly, uh, giant. friendly <laughs> giant right like you can hear all those sounds of our preschool lives so you start there you talk about that you share that you feel it what it was like because it was a part of you um, you then move through into your school lives from elementary and what did that look like and what experiences were presented. Um, you go into junior high and then all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, all of a sudden music showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and you had so much music in your life in junior high. And then you went on to high school and you started becoming very much more particular about what you were going to listen to. And then you went off into your young adulthood. And some of us, like me, when I had my children, 
all of a sudden it went to what my children were listening to and I sort of forgot about myself. So my personal soundtrack reminds me that there's about a, a five or six year gap where I wasn't adding in music for myself. So that gives me some information. And then it goes on and on and on as, as throughout um, how we age. So that's probably the best one to start with. And it sounds so simple, but we don't spend necessarily a lot of time with it and actually journal it down and write it down and write our experiences. Um, it is something that we can connect to and then maybe start that music club. So again, it becomes a sharing moment. Oh, wow. That, uh, I can't wait to, <laughs> I can't wait to dive <laughs> into that. <laughs> now, I wanted to talk as well about your, your latest book, Wellness Incorporated, because as I understand it, this is a book that actually applies or helps other professionals mm -hmm. apply mm -hmm. your learnings. Can you tell us about it? When did it come out? And, and um... Yeah, so it came out a year ago, actually a year ago, January. Um, and it was, um, yeah, it was a, a, a sort of like the real bridge between um, being a music therapist but definitely having to be entrepreneurial and start a business around that and realizing that the language that we used around our business was different than other businesses, that the lens in which we looked at was definitely from a health and wellness perspective of our clients, but also of our business. You know, what, what truly is a healthy business? What's a well business? And it was so much beyond looking at just profit. And as I went on, I, I decided to um, complete a, an MBA 20 years after I started my business with a focus on social entrepreneurship, which was the closest I could find to health entrepreneurship. And even as I was doing that, I learned a lot, but I realized that being in this health and wellness industry providing direct service to other humans was uniquely different. So Wellness Incorporated um, came out of that. And I felt it was a book that was needed for many other people like me. I dedicated it to my 21 year old self when I started this business. And, uh, and it's the book that I wish I would have had, especially in that first decade. It's the nine steps to a values driven and sustainable business. So you can keep going on for these three decades. And I look forward to, uh, continuing to do this for the rest of my life. So I plan to all also reread my book. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And, and I can see value for so many different entrepreneurs uh, in, in, in that because it comes back down to the fundamentals. Let's say the, um, the, the, the beat of, the, mm -hmm. of their song, mm -hmm. potentially. Exactly. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, so inspiring. Thank you for, for sharing mm -hmm. so many insights uh, with me. Uh, one last question, and, and then I'm going to get to the, to the, mm -hmm. the, the closer. But I guess I was thinking about the difference between because uh, you've done three, you've, you've created music, you've mm. created a business, and you've mm. created a book. Mm. Uh, are there parallels in those paths? Yeah, you know, that's such a good question, too. I've, I've thought about there's something about just art, creating art. And um, Definitely around music and around music therapy, there's a real art to that and a real art to engagement and business is the same. It feels like making art to me. Um, writing a book, certainly, again, that creative spirit and essence um, of art continues to co come around and, and, and play. There's play in all of it. You know, we don't talk about play in business a lot. Um, if it wasn't fun, I don't think I'd still be doing it. Yeah. Excellent. And you already um, uh, asked, you already pointed out uh, the question because it was, uh, what would you tell your 21 year old self or your younger <laughs> self? Just like, I wish you had this book, obviously. Totally. <laughs> so you already answered that question beautifully. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, please let my listeners know where they can learn and find out more about you online. 
Oh, thanks. And thanks for having me today, Mark. This was a really, I, I really enjoyed our discussion a lot today. Sure. Um, so I can be reached anywhere around the social media land. So whether you're on Twitter or LinkedIn, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram. So I'm, I'm very much there either under Jennifer Buchanan, but also my company, JB Music Therapy. Uh, you can also um, connect with me through my books. If you're interested in learning more about music therapy, that's the book Tune In. And if you're in health and wellness sector or any entrepreneur who's very people centric, you will be interested in Wellness Incorporated. Awesome. Well, Jennifer, thank you for what you do in helping uh, enrich uh, other people's lives. And thanks for hanging out with me today. Thank you. I just had such a great time chatting with Jennifer, and it was such an inspiring conversation. I love the story she shared of her grandfather. And again, we're in such a divisive um, part of modern history where loved ones are, are not speaking to one another because of politics and things that are going on. And it's difficult. It's it's a, a challenging time, and and I and I look for and I long for those things that remind us of the commonalities, of the ways that we can connect and 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 love one another and and respect and care for one another, and music is a beautiful thing that bridges that gap. And I just that the moment where the, you know the grandfather that you couldn't reach and and prior to they they did not have a good relationship. You know it was not. Um, fond of the grandkids or any of those things and yet the music reached him in a way that nothing else could reach him with with what had happened to him and and the way it reached those other people and how that was a life-changing moment for jennifer i love that i I was, i'm so glad that she got to share that with you guys and and then i was thinking about the exercise she likes to do uh, music therapy exercise of playlists and playlists are such a really fascinating thing because it's a it, it, she talked about the way that you a song resonates with you and you really just he's like I love this don't, don't do you feel that do you feel that like here here listen I want you to feel this great thing I feel and and, and it's 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 what we do I mean when we were when I was young you, you'd make a you'd make a mixtape for someone you had a crush on right or even as you know at the beginning of relationships some so one of the things that seems to have been a commonality is oh here are my songs when you listen to these songs these are me this is this is my song and and and, and that's an exercise that I have engaged in and it's been really been fascinating to to hear or this song reminds me of us yeah, that, that's also uh, a really common thing in relationships. But when I was thinking about the playlists, I, there's so many things you can do with playlists. You can have playlists for writing different books, which I'm sure people do. If you do have playlists that you prefer when you're writing different styles of books, like fiction, nonfiction, or short stories or whatever, I'd love to hear what those are in the comments at startreflections.ca. But one of the things that I was thinking of, which could be a really interesting creative exercise, is... There, there was a, there's a, an old um, a discussion I remember uh, listening to where um, people say, well, what's your song? Like when you walk into the room, think of Darth Vader. When Darth Vader walks into the room, you get the dom, bom, 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 bom. Right, you get that um, sound effect, not, not, you know, way better than I do it. But that's Darth Vader's theme when he walks into the room. What's your song when you walk into a room, when you walk around a corner, maybe in one of those high school classic movie scenes where the, you know you walk around the corner into the cafeteria, what's the music that's playing? So uh, uh, thinking about that, when you're writing a scene with a, a character, whether it's a main character, whether it's a secondary character, what's the song that would be playing to accompany them walking into the room? Or them walking down the street or whatever. And and that could be an interesting exercise for you to think about all of those different elements that you're compiling into that fiction. Now, I know this this uh, is a podcast about the business of writing and publishing. But, hey, I'm going to get into the craft once in a while. And I'm going to reflect on something that could work for the craft. Because as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, well, what is you know the opening scene uh, where Gail is on a morning run? What's the music that is playing? while we're watching her run. What is the music that's playing when Michael walks into this restaurant uh, to, to go meet someone for uh, dinner? What's the music that's playing? 
what is the music playing uh, in your life at different moments? What's the music playing for some of your different characters? Anyways, that's just some of the things that this conversation with Jennifer has made me reflect on. What has it made you reflect on? And I would love to hear your thoughts on playlists and even the the soundtrack that it's when you walk into the room. You can leave you can leave those comments over at StarkReflections.ca. And who knows? You may be surprised. You may be surprised with a related prize associated with this episode's guest. But that's all I'm going to say. Thank you so much for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. This has been episode 151, and I am Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Appreciate you listening. If you want to help support this podcast, you've got the Patreon, but that's not it. Just listening to the podcast alone is is thanks, and I really appreciate that. And if you want to share this podcast with someone that you think would find value in the Stark Reflections, go ahead and do that. That's a great way to help me out. You can also leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. So again, this is the end of episode 151. This is Mark Leslie, and I will catch you next episode. So until then, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.